Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, welcome to the NPA. Just as a heads up, we are recording this meeting, and so just keep that in mind. Um, and let me know if you hear better if I will if I should take off my mask and such. Um, I will get started by doing some quick intros, so just going around and um, saying hi if you feel comfortable and what ward you are a part of, and you can hand it off to someone else. So, hi everyone, I'm Hannah King, I'm from Ward 8, and I am on the steering committee, and I am going to pass it off to Jack. Hey everyone, I couldn't hear until just a moment ago, um, but I can now. My name is Jack Hansen. I am the East District City Councilor, and I live in Ward 8. Great, thank you. Um, and then I'll pass it off to Linda. Hi everyone, I'm Linda Rizzi, and I live in Ward 8. Thank you, Linda. And then um, we can hand it off to Kathy. Here's a word through again. Uh, I'm Kathy Allwell, school commissioner from Ward 20. I don't know. I'm going to put them in. But I live in Ward. Thank you. Um, and then we have some folks in the room, so we'll just quickly go around and intro them. Do you folks want to say hi? Sure. <laughs> hi. I'm Cheryl Green, and I live in Ward 1. Uh, Peter Lukowski, Ward 1. Do you need to talk through that? Yeah, you can talk. You can talk, like this camera is also picking you up. Yes, yeah, so you can just talk into the okay. mic. Karen Long, Ward 1. Richard Hilliard, Ward 1. Tom Darenthal, Ward 1. Carol Livingston, Ward 1. Keith Pillsbury, Ward 8. Chris Hazley, Ward 3. Great, thank you. I think that is everyone that's on right now. I know. Um, next, we'll go into any announcements. Does anyone have any announcements? Kay. Yes. Um, we'll go to Tom and then Keith. We're gonna, we will, um, we will be having a raffle uh, right at the end of the meeting for, uh, and we'll be collecting names on this sheet for people who are here and off the screen for people who zoom in. And um, what do people get? They get, why am I blanking? It, Locavore. It's Locavore. A Coupons. Locavore membership for a year. Awesome. Thank you. And then Keith, you had an announcement? The, the, the mayor has uh, called a special election for December 7. Ward 8 is always in need of volunteers. You can be from any uh, area in the city. Uh, we would appreciate if you contact me as the ward clerk so that we uh, can have volunteers. We need uh, at least 20 to 24 volunteers for the day. Great, thank you. Um, next, we're gonna head into speak out. So you can oh, just, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, so you can just indicate by raising your hand and then I'll go to folks in the room as well. The issue that I was asked to raise was from Jared Wood. Um, he wanted to raise the question of road safety with the increasing number of e-bikes. So food for thought. Um, he, you can contact him if you have any questions, but he wanted to make sure we brought that up. And then I will go to Linda. Linda, I think you're muted if you're talking. How is that? That's perfect, thank you. So good evening, my name is Linda Rizzi, and I'm a resident of Ward 8. And I wanted to say two things about redistricting. Um, the first point I wanted to make is that the redistricted map should not be gerrymandered. In general, there are principles of proper redistricting to avoid gerrymandering, which are available to read and learn about, and these principles should be applied. And more than one of them is relevant to her age. One of the principles I'd like to address here is called compactness. Individual districts should be compact in appearance without wing-like protrusions on the map. 
Wings are an excellent indicator of gerrymandering. If you look at a map of Ward 8, you can see that Ward 8 is nothing if not a wing. And I think this should be addressed with the new map. And it might require considering changing the map, of course, naturally, or even eliminating Ward 8 altogether. Another point that I think is relevant for board construction that came to my attention when I was on the Energy Steering Committee is that UPM, rightly so, limits access to the campus if you're not a student or otherwise affiliated with UPM. The rules surrounding this are understandable. And UPM is a private institution. But it's important to note that the grounds are not public streets of Burlington. And that means that for contested races in Ward 8, in comparison to a candidate who is affiliated with UPM, a non-affiliated candidate is at a steep structural disadvantage in the ward. That's because the student population, which is studying and off giving campus, and such a huge proportion of our voter base is less accessible for direct grassroots campaigning by a candidate not affiliated with UPM. And I think this concern should also be addressed with the redistricting. And um, I'm running out of time, I'm sure. Um, I'm not going to the other chances to speak on other issues. I, um, so um, I did hear an idea about at-large counselors. I'm not sure what that, um, I'm not exactly sure, but anything is worth to look at, I think. And that's all, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, so for folks that are just joining us, we are currently doing speak out. So if you'd like to participate, just indicate by raising your hand or giving a thumbs up. Does anyone want to speak out? Yeah, I see Carol in the room wants to speak. So you can just talk into the microphone. Let's my mask. Yeah, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, thank you. So um, I want to echo what Jared Wood said. He also called me. And one of the other things he said is he thought that e-bikes should be insured and registered like a motorcycle or like a, you know, like the little <coughs> motor scooters are. So anyway, because he called me specifically, I told him that I also would mention that. Um, I did want to mention, you know, there's been things on Front Porch Forum and stuff about that we aren't having the enforcement about traffic stops and citations because we have lost some of the police funding. But that really is not true. If you can remember, all of you who came religiously in 2019, John Murad came and spoke to us in October, so two years ago. And he told us they had stopped um, giving traffic violations and your citations because people didn't like it. Does anyone remember being there? And he was saying it was much better. He says, people don't like enforcement. I have this like in a letter too, because I wrote him afterwards. He said, traffic calming and engineered solutions were a better approach. Now, most of us at the NPA that day did not agree with him. We all said that we want enforcement. We want, Jared Wood's been upset for years about what it's like to be a walker in Burlington. Um, so I don't think it's fair to complain, you know, or blame that on the police situation now. And my other thing about the police is Church Street has become really bad lately. And for the high school kids, my granddaughter is a freshman at Macy's. And she walks from Elm Terrace, so she has to go either on Winooski or Church Street up and to Macy's. And every morning, she is spoken to. She's not comfortable because of the number of people that are loitering and smoking on Church Street. So I really think we need to deal with that. I called the school about it. I called the police about it. Um, also because of the number of, late in the day, the people that are just hanging out at that fountain in front of City Hall and smoking. Like, for 40 minutes, the whole time I was in City Hall, I came back out, same group of six were just there smoking. So we really need to deal with that, um, or people won't go to Church Street anymore. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else want to participate in Speak Out? Yeah, Tom. Tom. Just to follow up to the e-bike uh, discussion, and that's it. Uh, Jared Wood did send out an article. There's a fairly good article about 
New York City's experience with a surge of e-bike riders. And um, for people who are interested, I'd encourage you to seek out that article in the Times and read it. Great, thank you. Last call for Speak Out. One more question, one thing, and this, I think Jack might be the only one here. Um, when I did call the police with my concern, the dispatcher told me to speak to my counselors because of their lack of funds, and that's why they weren't monitoring Church Street. But she did tell me that the city had hired Chocolate Thunder to monitor City Hall Park but that that was only temporary and that it was too expensive <clears throat> and not effective because Chocolate Thunder could not um, give tickets or anything. Chocolate Thunder, I know, is a group, they like go to big concerts. They're sort of like the bouncers at a concert. So anyway, if Jack, when you speak or now, if you could address that, because I don't like hearing that people don't want to go to City Hall Park and they don't want to go to Church Street because of you know, <clears throat> people not feeling comfortable. That's Keith. Great, thank you. And then Keith, I see your hand is raised. Thank you, uh, thank you, Hannah. One of the things that I that I haven't been mentioning, but it seems like it's it's one of those necessary things that we have to mention. Those of us who live in on streets that are heavily uh, uh, house, housing um, student renters, it, it's always a uh, change for them, and they come in the fall, living in a mixed neighborhood and learning how neighborhoods work. And it, there has been significant um, increase in. Uh, different kinds of noise behaviors and bomb fires. And what's happened with uh, the situation is that the uh, police aren't really uh, saying they want to help us. So we're out there at, at 1 o'clock, 2, 1.30 or 2 in the morning on a Saturday and Sunday, possibly Saturday. Saturday. Sunday morning, kind of just talking to them. That is our. That is the way we react to these kind of behaviors. To kind of teach them that it's important to to have certain behaviors, social behaviors in a neighborhood. It would be helpful though if we could talk to their uh, their landlords, let them know that there are some issues with their uh, renters. But the city is unable to provide us with contact information where we used to have it. I've contacted. I put in a public information request last March and have not received it. I've called uh, Bill Ward at, uh, I guess, the director of permitting and zoning and haven't received a call back. It seems like they really want us, uh, the, the long-term residents on a street that is trying to make a neighborhood, um, a mixed neighborhood, but families, retirees, and students, they really want us to do all the work. And it is really tiring if you've lived on a street for over 40 years which most of the people who are long-term uh, residents on University Terrace have been. So I think the city needs to also, we've heard all of this about the police, well, how about helping the neighborhood people so that they can um, have some uh, sort of a social environment that is workable for everybody? Great, thank you, Keith. Um, final call for Speak Out, and then we're going to the council report. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, I'm Chris Hazley uh, from Ward 3. I just wanted to speak to your comments, ma'am, about the state of affairs on Church Street. Uh, I live pretty close to there, uh, and I can, uh, you know, corroborate what you have said. Um, in the past week, we had an overdose death in the parking garage. We've had a lot of issues of vandalisms and larcenies out of the same parking garage. Uh, we had had a couple of gunshot incidents back in July. Um, things have unfortunately started to decline. Um, in the downtown core due to the deterioration of the uh, foot patrols that are, are no longer able to be uh, implemented due to staffing. So in an effort to kind of get a better understanding of what's going on and, and how we arrived at this situation, I reached out to the police chief and met with him last week along with the deputy chief and sadly uh, learned that due to some folks that are kind of in the process of retiring and some folks that are into uh, the process of transferring to some of the other departments and the state police, uh, the force is going to continue to decline in numbers through the end of the year, and they're estimating that it's going to end up somewhere in the high 50s. So uh, 
speaking, you know, for the folks downtown, what we would like to see is uh, we'd like to see some foot patrols to kind of come back and, you know, have people walking a beat to try to deal with that. But, you know, I've walked into my parking garage, you know, every other day I see someone literally sitting there, you know, a group of people in a circle and we injecting heroin. I walked in the other day, there's a woman with a needle in her arm. And it's just like, that's an everyday occurrence. And it didn't used to be that way. And um, I'm not sure what the solution is, but um, I'm hopeful that we can put our heads together and, and come up with one. Great. Thank you all. We're going to head into the council reports now. I see that we have Councillor Hansen and Hightower, so whoever wants to take it first, feel free. Uh, Sorry, do you want to? Huh? Sorry, do you want me to? Okay. I can okay, go down and check. To... But, um, I, I'll try to cover. Just we've, we've had two city short list of, meetings since oh, uh, the, the last ten meeting, so I can hit on oh, things from oh, the yeah. level, and then I'm not sure what Zariah is going to get into, and if we have questions. So, but I'll try to like I'll try to power through just high level what some of the big things we've done are. Um, so. We, so at our September 13th meeting, um, we moved forward, um, we moved forward 1.8 million of spending of ARCA money. Um, if you all remember, we, Burlington got 27.3 million. Um, we had used a chunk of that uh, back in April and now we used another 1.8 million. The rest of it will be there's a community process underway, and I think there's an online survey out now to start to get public input, but the bulk of, um, hopefully the rest of the remaining money um, will be kind of vetted by the community and we can collectively make a decision about what to prioritize and how to move forward within the constraints of it. Um, but we did spend some money on public health measures and also on property tax credit relief um, and for some water and wastewater and stormwater work. Um, we move forward on Champlain Parkway um, in terms of basically splitting the project into two separate projects, um, one of which will move forward uh, next year, the other will be delayed until 2025, and this way we can hopefully sync this project up with the rail yard enterprise project and get rid of the potential um, traffic impacts in the King Maple neighborhood um, by syncing those projects up. Um, we also move forward a revenue bond proposal from Burlington Electric Department. That's going to be on the December 7th ballot. Um, and this would really allow BED to um, go out and, and borrow money to invest in not only um, system reliability, but no also in their net zero initiative, okay. trying to decarbonize um, and, and electrify Burlington. So it's not a tax increase, it's just allowing them to borrow. Um, and it's not only is this allowing the utility to be more reliable and, and to get off of fossil fuels, but it's also um, projected to actually put a downward pressure on rates. So it should be economically beneficial to ratepayers as well, is what they're projecting. Um, we started the ball rolling on a charter change to allow all legal residents to vote in Burlington in local elections, regardless of citizenship. Um, that, was, that was kind of high level September 13th meeting. We had another meeting on September 27th. Um, we, at that meeting, we put on the ballot the sustainable infrastructure bond, um, which is really to, it's, it's an extension of what was a five-year bond approved in 2016, and it's the next round of that, which will allow the city to, you know, pay for streets, sidewalks, um, memorial auditorium, and a bunch of other uh, infrastructure projects. Um, we did have an executive session about UVM providing more housing. So it was executive. I can't, we, we can't share details of it, but excited. I'm excited that that conversation is happening, I guess is what I'll say. Um, 
we move forward the first step of an ordinance amendment around sustainable transportation requirements for new developments. We voted on the, the waste, um, the municipal collection of waste, um, recycling organics and, and solid waste. Uh, we did not move that forward though, and so we're gonna be looking at an alternative, maybe a hybrid system that provides a more efficient system of pickup of waste collection, but done by private haulers for the organics and um, solid waste and continue the city recycling pickup program. Um, and then the, uh, the final thing from 27 was we approved a scaled down version of um, what the mayor and police chief had brought forward around financial incentives to retain and recruit um, sworn officers at BPD. Um, so it's basically incentive pay um, a few months out, another for, for current employees that stay on, another one a year out. Um, and then incentive pay for, for new recruits who stay on for at least a few years. Um, so yeah, that's a high level of some of the things we did at our last couple meetings. Great, so I'll jump in um, and then I guess we'll get the questions if that's okay, Anna. Um, great, so for some public safety updates, you know, Jack and I didn't talk about what we would cover, so great to have that general overview. For public safety updates, um, BPD has been hiring for the positions the council approved back in February, which included the community service liaisons, which are those social work positions, so all three of those are now um, filled, which is exciting. Um, one of them is in BPD, two are in the CJC, but still being trained by and reported by Lacey Ann Smith, who sits in the Burlington Police Department. And then um, I think they hired the first four and are closing on the a fifth of the 10 community service officers that um, we have to February, so that I think is when we're talking about the patrols, those um, those are folks who would fill some of the patrol positions. Um, and then I think I just want to speak to what somebody said in public comment. I'm sorry, I think at this beginning of public comment because I didn't realize the meeting starting at 6.45, I missed that. Um, but um, just, I think, want to do a general acknowledgement that um, opioid deaths are up across the U.S., but even more so in Vermont, and that's not necessarily related to local factors as much as pandemic and economic and mental health factors. Um, and um, a few other things is just, um, uh, I know that sh things that are coming to council that folks might want to look out for, so more of a look ahead than a look back is um, short-term rentals are going to come to Council soon, and would love folks' opinions on that. Just because we've had a lot of, um, you know, investment property owners weigh in, and not as many, you know, homeowners who don't have Airbnbs or really any renters. I don't think we've had any renters weigh in on the conversation at all. So, um, just as that's coming up, would love to hear folks' opinions. Um, other things that's coming up is Joe McGee. Um, who's a new counselor has been working really hard on um, the reappraisal and making sure that that coming up um, is looking more <laughs> equitable and finding ways um, to clean up that process and have it go better than it did this time around. Um, and I, that's all I can think of off of the top of my head. Um, but Jack, if there's anything else that's coming up that you want to highlight? Um, I guess maybe let's see if people have questions and we can guide us of what to talk about. Otherwise, yeah, we can keep talking. Great. And one more comment, sorry about that. It's just because I don't want to completely forget is one of the things that we passed um, with the last election was a whole host of um, charter changes and questions which are all still sitting in the state house. Um, so one of the things that um, I think we're going to be working on 
with the city's legal team, but also just as individual counselors, is um, making sure that some of those charter changes, all of which passed by more than 60%, um, with the voters um, get passed at the state level. We're not, I guess, making sure, but trying to do our best to make sure. Okay, does anyone have any questions for the council? Yeah. Hi, thank you, Jack and Zariah. My name is Cheryl Green, and I my question is about the progress on the process to hire a new police chief. Is there anything that you can talk about where that is, what the timeline is, um, what the council's role will be in that? I don't know if Jack knows more than I do, but I know that we have the application, but there's a committee that's been set aside, which includes Jane. Um, so it was said that she's not here because she would know the most up-to-date information, and I know that they've reviewed, that they have the applications and they're reviewing them. I'm not sure what the next steps are or how fast those will happen. Maybe Jack does. Yeah, there's a... Uh... There's a committee working on that that, that Jane's a part of, or a working group. Um, they had whittled down, I think they had, they had honed in on four, on four applicants that they felt were the strongest of the initial pool. Um, but I think there's also a feeling of the need to get more additional applicants um, and not just necessarily um, move ahead with those four. So. I'm not sure exactly where it's at, but I know that there was a feeling of potentially reposting or re-advertising, trying to get, get additional applicants. Um, the mayor was thinking of um, calling a special meeting of the council to bump up the, um, the pay that we're offering, that we're posting for the position to try, as a way to try to get new applicants, but um, I think there wasn't enough interest from counselors to kind of do a special meeting sp specifically on that, but that's one idea that at least the mayor has floated. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hope that's a little bit helpful. And yeah, it's too bad Jane's not here because she's she could give the most direct perspective. Thank you very much. And not that this question was asked, but I do want to add one more comment on public safety since we're talking about it again, which is um, that the administration, I think, is finalizing. I just gave comments on what it seemed to be a fairly final version, um, a request for a proposal for a the Cahoots model that we've been talking about for you know well over a year now. So hopefully that's a um, request that will go out soon for firms to send proposals in for. Great, thank you. Linda, I see you have your hand raised, so feel free to go. Yes, I had a question. Um, so I, wasn't, I wasn't clear about what Soraya meant. Um, she was talking about the doing something with the reappraisal. Is that something going to be kind of back of the committee that's going to repair this situation? Um, the homeowners have really gotten slammed, and there's a lot of, um, I mean, I'm, you know, the value seem kind of crazy, and at least they're not all crazy in the same way for different people. So, is this something that you're talking about trying to fix for the next business, or is it something you're trying to talk about trying to fix for now? Yeah, so there's two different things, I guess, that the resolution that's coming up will do. And I think one of them is um, changing the process that will go through next time to make sure that um, it's a process that feels more equitable rather than having quite so many on the back end um, folks asking for realignments and that process not really feeling really transparent and um, clear or based on as much data as folks would like um, figuring out you know a better reappraisal process from the beginning and then there's also a list of recommended solutions for the city attorney's office to look into some of which would address this past 
um, the appraisal, um, which I can't off the top of my head say what some of those um, measures were. Um, and then I think the last thing is, is just making sure that the next reappraisal doesn't happen in 15 years, but that this is a process that happens more frequently. Well, can I just make a comment that, you know, the math reappraisal is, I think, is basically, it's just expecting to be giving a uh, general idea about what the value of your house is, and that there's the expectation that the, the values will be changed once once uh, the homeowner looks at it and talks to the appraiser. Because the appraisers don't come into the home. They're just looking at, uh, I don't know what they're looking at exactly, but it's just a massive appraisal. It's not the kind of appraisal that you know can, can give you a, a true value. And so, and it seemed like these appraisers um, really hung their hat and their pride on, you know, not changing anything instead of painting. And in my opinion, understanding is the process is you kind of slap a number on that seems about right and then work it out. Uh, so many people, myself included, um, felt that, um, and I want to just talk about feelings, um, you know, had good evidence or how why that values were off and um, you know pretty much ignored. When it seems like the idea is that the process if, if the very nature of a mass reappraisal is that the details have to get ironed out they sort of, you know, they'll have to be ironed out. Instead of, you know, you don't know what you're talking about or we don't care. Yeah, I think that is definitely the feedback, and I want to let Jack speak as well because he didn't answer the first question, but I think that's definitely the feedback that we heard. And then two, I think it was just also really unclear because we only had the values at the beginning and not the um, not the proposed tax rate that went along with it. So I think folks even had a hard time understanding the impact of them and whether or not they should um, appeal until late in the game. and. Um, so, yeah. So that is isn't rocket science. Every time for generations have been going through this, and the fact that this happened, it's really not, I don't even think it's acceptable. Yeah. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money to have to pay, and frankly, it'll be a lot of money being passed on to renters you know, uh, when they lords can't, you know, when they can't afford to absorb it. It's a lot of money, it's, so, you know, it can be a lot of culture and money with money to increase taxes. Definitely. I, I think this resolution is really important. It's, um, maybe I can send it around to people after. It'll go public tomorrow, so at that point, um, anyone can get access to it from the city website. But Joe took the lead on it, Joe McGee and Gene Bergman. Um, and with a, they worked with a, a group of folks. I think Jonathan Chapel Sopo, who's a part of this FBA, I think he was um, part of that as well. Um, but the, it basically, the resolution lays out like all of these issues that we've heard, issues with Tyler, issues with the process, issues with how it was communicated to people, issues with the outcomes and the appeal process. It really gives voice to what I think we've been hearing a lot and what has been, like you said, Linda, I think ignored. Um, and then what it does is it lays out a number of potential solutions that specifically get at lowering the burden on residential properties. Um, and it lists like 10 or 12 possible solutions. One example, that I'll just throw out that's in there would be to increase the commercial property tax rate up to 150% um, rather than 120% so that commercial properties could get back in line with kind of paying the share that they've historically paid. Um, it was raised to 120% in the 80s basically for the same reason, but it's over time that their proportion has been eroded. Um, so that's just one example. There's, there's like 12 different examples of how can we reduce the burden on 
um, the residential side. And what it does is, what the resolution will do, and this is coming on Monday night, um, would create a public hearing process so that people can weigh in, give voice to these things, consider these potential options, and it would be a committee, ideally, that's you know taking this public hearing and then coming up with a set of recommendations. It also is gonna charge the city attorney with basically telling the council, here's what you can do under the charter now, um, and here are potential charter changes that you can pursue, and it has the community development and neighborhood revitalization committee um, looking into all these potential changes. So I think the idea is this is this huge problem that everyone's feeling and that everyone's talking about, and we really need a robust process to actually not only give people voice, not only give voice to that, but actually move forward, because I think the administration has really failed to do so and so the council now is stepping in and just to remind people like we didn't have the council didn't have any authority over how the appraisal played out this time or we weren't involved in it but we are now taking it upon ourselves to step in and try to make as many changes as we can both now but also looking ahead to the next um next reappraisal I can add something which is um, related to the bond type types of things that you're talking about, all of which seem really important. I don't really know whether people will be hard pressed to vote for things when they already feel oppressed by this reappraisal. You know? Understood. Yeah, I definitely understand that and the <clears throat> The November sustainable infrastructure bond will it's a two it will require two thirds voter approval. Um, I think that's definitely on everyone's minds. Um, at the same time, like the reason I supported still moving it forward despite that is because we, if you look at where all this infrastructure is at, we the more we delay, the more we're going to have to pay on it to, by deferring it further, and so giving the voters the opportunity. I don't know for sure that it will pass, but I think we need to give people the opportunity because there is a higher cost to delay. If it does fail in November, there could be an opportunity to change it and put something else on the March ballot for people to consider. Okay, I wanna in be- In December, I think I said November, but December 7th. I want to be mindful of time, so if there's any final questions. Okay, cool. Um, next, we're going to go on to the school board. So, Kathy, any <coughs> updates you have for us? Hi. Yes, I think from what you wrote in. And one of the things you really wanted to hear about were the facility, the BHS facilities and what was going on there. I have one other thing that I really would like to talk about to at the end. But um, last night, the Finance and Facilities Committee heard from the real estate group that has been looking into the three options, which are the site of BHS on Institute Road. One of the places they were looking at was in front of what is the present high school. And the other site they were looking at was across Institute Road in front of the athletic field, but in what is, I guess, the baseball fields. And the third was the Oh God, now I'm going to forget the name of what, the downtown one that the Gateway Block. Gateway. <clears throat> on, on Main Street, using the um, old fire, fire, well, it's not old, it is an older fire, fire station, fire station that's on, on North Winooski as well as the parking lot 
and also um, Memorial Auditorium, and there is a property in between that was an old motel, and they would be willing to give that space up to be used as well, but they want in the basement of what would be proposed or in the street level, um, they would like to have some sort of um, space there. They have given a certain amount of space, and I can't remember what it is, 100 and something, or 1,000 and something square feet, that they would like as, um, God, what are the words, passing by the storefronts along there, that they would rent out. And so the, they have put together, the real estate group has put together a very, very preliminary kind of footprint of what a building in each of these places, uh, each of these three um, places could look like. It's very clear at the, at the north or north in front of the old BHS, that that is the area that at least from the soils and the geology that they have looked at so far probably could take the largest building would be the cheapest for us to build on. The, the site in the old baseball fields, there's a lot of the soils there are probably not because it's landfill. It, they probably would have to be taken a new land, a new fill put in to make it take such a large building on that site. So that would be a more expensive site. It also I don't know, they were showing these and they are on the website, on the, um, if you look at the board docs, all three of these are there for people to actually look at. When it came down to an end, the downtown site seems to be far smaller. There were two options, one with using Memorial Auditorium, and the other was with just taking Memorial Auditorium down and using the land that it's on. But evidently, there is a huge pipe that was built in the 1800s under this whole piece of land that the city, we would, we would so slightly have to pay for all of our infrastructure to go around that pipe because they don't want us to feed into it. It's, it sounded like, I, I mean, I didn't write everything down, but please, if you want to see the exact description, it is on the website from the real estate group. It, it sounded like that would be an extremely expensive site to do a lot of what we need to do, and we, it would not even fit all of the high school and the um, tech center. There are at least two of the tech center programs would have to be off site. That would be, and maybe even a third. So we would still be renting facilities elsewhere in the city to, for the tech centers, which makes that a very expensive option. But none of these things are set in stone yet. It is still in preliminaries, but they thought that they would like to give us at least some information about what they had gleaned up until now about those three sites. And if anybody has any questions about that, I can try and answer what I can, but. 
Um, I see Jean, you have your hand up. Karen has a question. Uh, yes, I haven't been following this much. I don't feel like, was there ever a survey done in the city of where people would like to see the high school? Because I've heard a lot of people say that they would like it to be more central, um, you know, in the downtown area so there wouldn't have to be so much transportation to the high school. And people are wondering, okay, what's being done with the, the pit towers cave um, pool in the city? So if you could address that briefly. Yes, this, this real estate group went out and looked at some 20 properties all, all over the city. And yes, one of those was the so-called pit, but um, the city is not happy with us taking on the pit for our high school because we don't pay taxes on, on our properties and that is definitely an area that they hope to get tax income for the buildings that would be put up there. So the only thing they could offer us was this gateway piece that go, is on directly on um, Main Street, bordered by Winooski and uh, Lord of it, uh, College. No. Union. 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 Sorry. So, but that yes. seems to be expensive too with the right. pipe you just described. <laughs> yes. So. And then Karen, you had your hand raised. Thanks. Kathy, thank you. Um, I'm not, I have followed it some. I'm not quite sure why you folks are taking choice number eight, which was the gateway project and putting, cause I know you had them ranked before or the real estate company did. Why they, you know, you're putting so much energy into that when it just seems like there are so many strikes against it. And I also, I mean, we need a school. My granddaughter is at Macy's and there are no windows in there. The lights are fluorescent, kind of like these in here. It's noisy. I mean, we need a school immediately. And I don't think, you know, I think we need to have a bond for that, not for all these other infrastructure things. Um, but I guess my main question is, how did the gateway block get turned into number three choice when it had been number eight? You know, why is the school board having to put so much energy into that? Um, it just seems like, you know, we can't waste time. We need a school, quickly. Right, but I think there has been a lot of people asking us to look at a downtown location. And, and it was the only option that was downtown besides the pit. And so we had already been told that the pit was not something the city would support. And so we decided that the other option was to look at this gateway option, which, I mean, it's looking like that might not also be an option, but that was the reason for looking at it. There are, there are a lot of people in the city that would like to see a more centrally located high school. And it is kind of the way education of the future is getting kids out of the high school and doing research and things within their community. And so having a downtown location would have been wonderful. And I have to admit, I'm one of those that really did want to see us move downtown and do something because it is the next generation. And I, but at the same time, I am very cognizant of what it would cost the taxpayers to do a lot of that. And we need to look for a site that is large enough for both our, 
our high school and our tech center because also our tech center is very much part of forward-looking education and we can't separate the buildings out. It makes it far more, you know, far less appealing to kids within the high school. It, it should be on one side. So there are many different things that are weighing into how we ended up with these three. And by sometime at the end of November, they will have finished all the work on these three sites, but that is the reason for going looking at the downtown site. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, is there anything else, Kathy, before we wrap up? Uh, the other thing that I, there is a, the superintendent's contract is up for renewal, and I have put out on the front porch forum there, this time we're going out to the community, we want to hear back from the community <coughs> how they think that he, you know, has done his job for the year that he's been there. And so we're, it's a very short um, questionnaire, but we ask that people get on front porch form and click on to that and answer the questionnaire for us. We'd like to see that. Great, thank you. Um, next, we are going to move on to the Ward 8 Steering Committee elections um, for Keith Pillsbury. Keith, do you want to say a few words or anything? Not to put you on the spot. Well, it just seems like something that I could give a little bit of time to as a community service, I guess. Um, if, as long as I'm in Ward 8, who knows? I'll be willing to help out and get suggestions on what we can talk about at these uh, MPA meetings. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're going to go into nominations and then we can hopefully confirm Keith. I would be honored to nominate Keith to join the Ward 8 Steering Committee with me. Is there a second from any folks in Ward 8? Oh, and second from Ann Brenya. So everyone from Ward 8, we raise our hand. Should I read the names of the people that I know of that are from Ward 8? Uh, so these are the only people that should vote, okay? This is Hannah King, uh, Keith Pillsbury, Linda Rizvi, Anna Brenya, Ann Brenya, Lisa Bridge, and Jim Cohen. And Jack. And Jack, sorry, yeah. So. Folks in Ward 8, if you would like to vote yes for Keith, you can indicate by raising your hand, unmuting yourself, however you feel comfortable. Raising my hand. So I see two on Zoom, and how many in person? Three, four. Okay. Anyone against? Seeing nothing. One. I see. I don't, is that a hand up from before? Is that is your hand up from before, Linda? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Congratulations, Keith. You're on the Ward Eight Steering Committee. Happy to have you. Um. Great. Next, we're moving on to redistricting. So Anne and Richard are here to give us some updates. So feel free to take it away. Hi, Richard and I are part of the uh, Ad Hoc Redistricting Committee. Um, I'm the Ward 8 representative and Richard is the Ward 1 representative. Um, as you may know, the city is undergoing a process of redistricting of the city wards in response to the 2020 census numbers. Um, at the last census in 2010, Ward 8 was created. While well, previously there I'm were- I'm having a hard time hearing through Zoom and maybe others are too. Sorry to interrupt. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not. Okay. Right. Um, so the last census was 
So. Do you mind getting here. closer to this? This is the microphone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to switch spots with me? I'm happy to move as well. And then bring in a chair for Richard. For Richard, do you want to come up here as well? Or Sorry to do that to you. Okay, um, I'll start again. Uh, Richard and I... Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Richard and I are members of the uh, Ad Hoc Redistricting Committee. I am the Ward 8 representative and Richard is the Ward 1. Um, so, as I was saying, the city is undergoing a process of redistricting the city boards in response to the 2020 census. And uh, the goal of redistricting is to equalize the number of residents in each ward. Um, all wards have increased in population since 2010, with the exceptions of wards three and seven. The ideal number of, in each ward is determined by dividing the population by the number of voting districts. So um, our role, can you hear me okay? No. No, I hear you so far, I'm listening. Right, I'll, I'll try and speak up. I'll try and yell. Yeah, this is not a good Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, overhead noise. So our role... I have, a, I have a suggestion. Yeah? And I could hear, I could hear um, Hannah when she spoke. So each, are you near the computer that the Zoom is on? The audio is not on. The audio is just there. Thank you, Linda. Is this any better? Any better? How's that? So far. Okay. Okay. Um, so our role on this committee is just to gather community input from members of the city and our respective wards. So some of the changes that are being considered are to increase or decrease the number of wards creating a city councilor at large, changing the boundaries of the wards, and changing the number of city councilors. So the forums for input will be this NPA meeting. So we're hoping people will give us community input um, today. Uh, a survey that will be posted, hopefully on Front Porch Forum and the city websites and at least two or three citywide public meetings to take place at some point in the future. So uh, originally we were supposed to finalize a report for feedback from the public to city council on November 8th, but we have requested an extension from city council and we are still waiting to hear back for sure about this extension. And Richard has more information about the timeline. Yeah, the timeline has has um, changed as of. Well, I would also like to say that Chris Hazley is is also part of the. Uh, aren't you part anymore? Uh, no, no, no. Got jobbed off. Yes. Um, hmm. as, too bad. as of today, we are working. This is the city speaking, not not Anne or me. We're working on a new ta timeline as far as public input is concerned, very tentatively working with October the 6th, 26th for a public meeting, October the 17th for a public meeting, and December 6th for a public meeting. One will be in the north, new North End, one will be somewhere central, and some, one will be in the South End. Um, we are pawns in the game really and the city and uh, and our city councillors probably know a little bit more about what's going on than Anne and uh, myself do. Um, we jumped the gun as far as uh, Ward 1 is concerned um, with the help of our uh, MPA steering committee especially um, uh, well with the help of the whole committee um, and we posted on Front Porch Forum this is exciting. <laughs> we posted on Front Sorry Porch Forum uh, a survey monkey uh, for which we got about 35 response, 33 responses, I think, at the moment. 
uh, uh, and I'll go through that, the, the questions that we asked and some of the feedback, just to give you, hopefully, uh, a chance to see what people are thinking about and some of the questions that we, the committee, uh, are going to be thinking about. I would say, before I get into that, uh, I heard what Linda Risby ha uh, uh, had to say, and Linda, I hopefully can um, address some of those questions later on, if that's okay. Um, so uh, I'll go through the Survey Monkey results. Uh, we had, uh, as of this morning, we had 33 responses, uh, which is not a heck of a lot, but it may be representative of, of uh, uh, Ward 1. Are you in favor of the current Ward District structure? Yes, 27%. No, 73%. If the city continues with this ward and district structure, is Ward 8 the ward that the ward that Ward 1 should be paired with? And this, I thought this was surprisingly close. Yes, 46. No, 54. I was sort of of the opinion that Ward 1 was trying to invest in the city and quality of life, and Ward 8 was sort of on the other side of the ledger, but um, <laughs> that's just some editorial comment, I guess. Should there be an even or odd number of city councillors? Only 10% were in favor of an even number, 48% said odd, 42% uh, 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 said just doesn't matter, in, in, inconsequential. Uh, there was an open-ended question, how many city councillors should there be? And the answers ran the gamut. Uh, I can go through the details if, if anyone wants them, but it runs the gamut from sort of somewhere around about eight to as many as 15 and different configurations. The, 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 I mentioned before that uh, City Hall intervened and the mayor offered that there should be one city councillor, uh, but we'll pass that over. Um, what do you think of having at-large city councillors along with the ward city councillors? 19% uh, they loved it, 23% said it's okay, 35% said prefer not, and 23% said it was a terrible idea. <laughs> so we are getting feedback. Uh, lastly, which best describes the role you expect of your elected city councillor? Mm -hmm. Advocacy for the ward was 44%. Advocacy for Burlington, 56%. Advocacy for the state, national, and global agendas, 0%. Uh, so city councillors, take from that what you will. Um, we also asked an open-ended question, any comments? And I know at least one or two people who I can see on the Zoom screen uh, offered um, very uh, constructive comments, and we'll put that together as part of the total package. Um, I think with that, well, we can uh, I've, I've just put together, I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here, but I do have the actual, or the, I think they're provisional figures from the, the um, 2020 census pending some clarification of some uh, uh, ho housing on the UVM campus in Ward 6 slash possibly Ward 8. Um, but the city population increased by, uh, my arithmetic's not very good, but it looks like about 5 or 6% um, from 42,400 to 44,700 um, from 2020. Uh, to 20, uh, from 2010 to 2020. Uh, ward 1, which was already the biggest and therefore the most underrepresented ward, increased by the most population. So I, I'm struggling to find where the 700 new uh, residents of Ward 1 are, but a lot of them are obviously in Bayberry Commons, 
uh, uh, and I'm not really quite sure what accounts for the rest. Uh, Ward 2 was pretty much just a small increase, Ward 3 was flat, Ward 4 was about 10% increase, so that's part of the new North End. Uh, Ward 5 was pretty flat, Ward 6 was uh, about a 5%, 6% increase, uh, so that also might be part of the student population, I'm not completely sure, uh, the demographics of that ward. Uh, up along uh, uh, South Prospect Street, etc. Uh, there's a slight decrease in Ward 7, so that's the other part of the, of the um, new North End. And a big increase, uh, not as big as Ward 1, but almost as big in Ward 8. So about 550 new uh, residents in Ward 8. So these things need to be considered uh, we have, for instance, we're here at the Ward 1, Ward 8 MPA, and we have, I uh, haven't added it up, and I'm going to try now, but about 13,000, yeah, 12,000 anyway, um, inhabitants, whereas the new North End has about 10,600. So the representation uh, you can do the arithmetic yourself. Ward 1 is actually out of compliance. The measurement for compliance with, um, I believe it's the city charter and probably state requirements, uh, is that there shouldn't be a deviation for any representative constituency uh, of more than 10%. And Ward 1 is about uh, ten and a half percent, ten point three percent, maybe uh, too many people for its number of city councillors. Whereas um, Ward Seven is about eleven percent the other way. So you can see that there are large disparities within the city, uh, and that is what we're going to have to deal with. Uh, that's a lot of talking and some, some numbers, but I'm just trying to show the dimension of, of the issue. Now, I think I will uh, put a lid on this for, for the time being, uh, but I have brought a copy of the uh, presentation that Anne and I received and Chris received um, three weeks or two weeks ago. Uh, at the meeting uh, in City Hall, and the city uh, new city attorney made a presentation and explained all the uh, all the, the city requirements and some of the guidelines. And uh, if necessary, I'll introduce one or two of the of the uh, slides and criteria uh, if the appropriate question comes up. But if anyone wants a copy of this, I can run a copy and get it to you. Um, I'm going to shut up. And um, what do you think? I think we should get some community feedback, input, if anybody has any. So does any, do any folks have any input to give? You can indicate by raising your hand or raising your hand. I see Zariah and Jack both have their hand raised, so we can start with them. I'm more just wondering if some of the figures that Richard just read off, if those are, if we can see those anywhere, if I'm a better reader than listener, or if I don't have, I don't have an electronic uh, presentation, partly because I'm not completely sure that the 2020 numbers can you take are not. Can a picture of it? Can I take a photo of it and email it to you right now? Is that oh, that would be amazing. I think the figures are, at, are pretty similar to what Megan uh, Tuttle had presented to City Council, um, but mm. the, the slides that I think Richard's alluding to are also posted on the city website on the redistricting page. Great, thank you. Yeah. I think I heard most of that. City website, redistricting page, and then what Megan Tuttle presented. Uh, Jack, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks so much for all your work on this and for already getting a jump on, you know, getting some of that community 
feedback through the survey. I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I'm definitely a strong proponent of getting rid of the districts, and I was glad to hear that the vast majority of people so far in the survey were, in, you know, also, were also not happy with the current ward and district model. I just think it's an issue of fairness, um, an issue of like simplicity and straightforwardness, um, and an issue of representation too. For example, if we had, if we took, if we still kept 12 city councilors but went to 12 wards, you would go from, you know, like district councilors like me right now represent 12,000 people. Instead, councilors would represent um, like 3,600 people. So I think there's a lot more accountability and it's a lot easier for councilors to be responsive um, and be accountable to the voters. So it would obviously be very disruptive for me personally because if my position gets eliminated, I'd have to run for something else or whatever. But I just think it's a much better system to have um, just straight up wards and it's it's simpler and smaller and more accountable. Um, and it's also fair because right now it's kind of weird that we represent twice as many people but have the same power, the same pay, the same everything as the ward counselors. So that's, I just wanted to weigh in with that and kind of put in my two cents for that. And then because of that and other issues and also the fact that Ward 1 and Ward 8 are underrepresented right now and aren't getting adequate representation, I do think there's some sense that there's some level of urgency around um, moving forward and trying to get the ball rolling for March ballot. I don't know if the new the new timeline that you all are requesting would still allow that or not. Um, so I guess that's a question: is would would the delayed timeline still allow a March ballot? Um, theoretically, and I from what I understand, a decision can't be made until City Council meets again which is the 18th, is that correct? We meet on Monday, yeah. Okay. And this is, this is the first time hearing um, about that, just, just so you all know. And I didn't know that um, what you had read from the administration was news to me as well. So council hasn't gotten any updates on this in a while, um, but I think as long as we can still get it on for March, I personally don't have any issue with taking more time. Jack, the only thing I would say is that these, um, the, the delays so far in getting this going are, are all from the city, they're not from the committee. Although given the timelines that the city has imposed, uh, that's why the, uh, that's why the, the committee requested an extension. So, um, Understood. Uh, you know, we met five weeks ago to do the nomination for for representation of these two wards, and we didn't have the kickoff meeting for another three weeks. So um, that wasn't our delay; that was the city's delay. And I, I would just add that there is a person who is assisting us with um, the compilation of the data, and she will need all of the data at least a week before presentation to city council. So um, there is there's a deadline that, for us, that precedes the deadline that the presentation goes to city council. Got it, got it, thank you both. Uh, Maddie, I see you have your hand raised and then we'll go to Kara. If you're speaking, Maddie, you're muted. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, sorry, I couldn't hear you initially, so that's why I didn't unmute. Sorry about that. So I'm Maddie Posey. I'm a resident of Ward 8, and I would just like to speak to the boundary lines that were drawn for Ward 8. If you look at it, it's a really strange um, boundary design, and it's almost as if it includes primarily all the UVM residence halls, sort of configured into one ward. 
and I just think it doesn't give a fair representation for the students. I think it would be better if they were more equitably distributed throughout the various boards and not concentrated in just one student board. I really don't understand how that configuration ever came to be. Um, so I would really appreciate the city councilors looking at you know, the boundary lines being redrawn more equitably. And then I also just want to put in my two cents that there have been a lot of um, high votes recently on the city council. And so I think an odd number of city councilors would help alleviate that situation. So those are the two points I'd like to make. Thank you. Maddie, can I just uh, say one thing? Um, sure. In the, uh, and, 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 and the, there might be a, a, a sequitur to this as well. The, the notes for the 2010 redistricting uh, considerations, the, the census was in 2010 and the actual changes were made about four or five years later, but one of their criteria was academic institutions should be in more than one ward. So uh, obviously they didn't follow that to the letter of the law. Um, and that might happen this time. The city attorney made it clear that regardless of what um, public input is, this will ultimately be a political process. So um, I will leave you with that. I, but I will also say that one thought, thing that I didn't understand, hadn't, hadn't never thought about it, but Anne brought it up. Uh, obviously, this affects um, uh, Keith knows all the city officers, but it affects the school board especially. And how many students do you reckon there were going to Burlington Public Schools from Ward 3? No, you mean Ward 8. Ward 8. Ward 8, yeah. Okay, as I was walking around, I counted a total number of 15 children under 18. How many went to this? our elementary school high, and high school was less than 10? So, <laughs> and I'm talking about I'm talking about children that were uh, part of our ward is uh, the facility for uh, for uh, families who are needing to be protected. At, that's at the Y W C A. So we have families there that are from um, we, that we have children that go, go to our elementary schools from that facility on Main Street, and that, that number varies depending on the families as they come and go in that facility. Well, um, you know, I think that's reprehensible personally, and I, I, I can't believe that the city thought that was a good idea. But I, I would say to uh, Zariah and to Jack, um, please don't let that happen again, because you're going you're gonna to do some of the uh, the uh, configuration of the wards, in, uh, regardless of our public input. So please don't let that happen again. I don't know that we heard what was said. <laughs> yeah, the, um, he, Jack, um, Richard brought up the fact that there are, in the Ward 8 school district, uh, there were, at least when Keith last tabulated kids in his uh, school board, school commissioner district there were 15 children or people under the age of 18 yes. and 10 of whom were in the public school system so we have one school commissioner representing 10 children and actually my two kids have graduated from high school since then so there's probably 13 now um, thank you for that and just to know on the redistricting website I'm not seeing the outputs of the survey so I assume that'll be part of the report, so it's not necessarily something that needs to happen now, but we, just, we don't have that yet. Well, Zariah, there will also be, uh, I said we jumped the gun, there will also be a uh, North Avenue News citywide survey. Uh, so okay. this was just to inform uh, the representative for Ward 1, uh, and I can let you have the deets if you need them. Okay. okay. Sure. Yeah, and thank you for repeating that. Sorry, we're having a little yeah, it's really bit of overtime here and everything. This is, this is not a great room yeah. for we'll meetings like this. Um, so yeah, do we get we the chance microphone? to talk about this? You're talking to us, but we're the ones that really are, are affected by this redistricting. And we haven't had a chance to talk about it. 
Well, are we going to get the chance to talk about it and get our point of view out? Or are we going to listen to you all the time? I, I really came wanting to talk about it, how I perceive re redistricting. Because of all the wards, Ward 8 was the most affected. And the, we are the ones, the, the ones that are um, long-term residents of Burlington. With, and it's just a small number in Ward 8. A very small number. We're out, we're, we have basically the ones that are affected the most, and it seems like we're, we're not given a chance to talk about it. Well, we're, you're, we're listening to you. I think it's important that you realize that Ward 8 is not like any other ward. Not like any other ward. You're talking about that Ward 1 is overrepresented, over, is underrepresented. Well, the, number, the least number of voters in the last March election were from Ward 1 and Ward 8. Ward 8 is lucky if it gets 20% of its 4,000, I don't know, 99 voters on the checklist, gets 20% of them to vote. Last time in March when we had that big election and the progressives were really getting the students out, we had, we had 837 votes in Ward 8. 837 votes. 250 of those were registered on the same day as they voted, which is their right. But what I'm saying is very few came off the checklist. That means very few people that actually have been long-term in Ward 8, actually, uh, uh, they're out there. It's not, when I, I have had to go and get a petition signed, which is only 30 signatures, Every year for it was every year for a city clerk uh, for a ward clerk. Then the next year was for city, um, school board. So I walked the whole ward. First of all, I can't get on the campus at UVM, which is where the majority of the people are, of our voters, um, not registered yet, but they're they're there. And I walk the streets every time, and I have a hard time finding thirty. 30 people who are actually registered before the end of January, which is when I have to have my petition in. And if anybody dies, I'm out of luck. I am constantly searching. <laughs> when I represented Ward 1, I could go out on a Saturday afternoon and get 200 signatures. Ward 8 takes me a whole week because I have to go back when people are home. So I'm just saying that the whole idea that we have a ward that is so dispersed where a majority of the voters are not accessible to anybody running for that who's a person that doesn't live on the campus. So, um, so Keith, what, what, do you have any ideas in terms of redistricting or changes uh, to the structure of the ward? Well, I think, you think would improve Brisbane that? really said it right. It has to be a, a compact area. Ward, my, my street has always sort of been isolated and stuck out there. We should really be in Ward 6. Not that I, you know, we've been in Ward 1, but we are connected to Ward 6 much closer than people on the other side of the campus. But for some reason, we get stuck here. The last time that we were going to be uh, the redistricting, the, the city council said that uh, my street and the first block on Summit Street where the mayor was, we were going to be in Ward 6. They, there was a meeting of some Ward 6 counselors or committee, I, I don't know. Next thing I know, we're back in Ward 8. We're back in Ward 8. So we, you, think, you think that changing the boundaries so that the wards are more reflective of neighborhoods might be a solution? I think it would be a, a very good solution. Okay. And I just want to tell you, that we have over 4,000 registered voters in Ward 8, and we've had anywhere from 150 votes. The most ever that we got, and who knows why, was in November 2018, was 1390. That's the most we ever got. We didn't even get that when Trump was running against Biden. Now, I do say that some of this redistricting had to do with power politics. And that's exactly what it is. That's why we have the way our city is running now. It's all about po political parties wanting more power. 
if you look at the representatives who are the Progressive Party, if you look at the number of votes they got in the last elections, they got a thousand votes less than five of the other representatives that happen to be of the Democratic Party. So it seems like we, our city, like our Senate, U.S. Federal Senate, is run by a minority of voters, and the majority are, are outvoted or, or we have ties as we're having. So I, I think it's really, for some of us, it's really losing trust in government, the way it's being run right now, and I think that is a shame. Okay. Thanks. Did I make my point clear? Yes. yes. <laughs> I applaud. So, thank you. Totally. I'm sorry, but I got frustrated because we're the ones that are most affected, and I don't want to. I just don't want to hear about. Well, th this is this is what this time is for to get yeah. feedback. So I well, think let's make sure we, we hear did more from more people. Maddie, and then you, and then is There's there anybody Linda. else? Carol. Okay, so Zariah yeah, so and Jack, can, that's enough. can they hear us? Because I'm wondering, Zariah spoke up before. Can you hear us? Did he hear me? I don't know. I don't know. I heard you loud. I mean, I can hear Karen. I've heard everything else thus far. All right, great. Because, yeah, it is hard to hear. I mean, I could hear you. Thank you for being. Yeah, but I want, they're the ones passionate. that make the decisions. Know, right. Not us. So I agree with Keith and Linda. And if you look at the map, which I have, all of the districts are little blocks. You know, they're like little blocks. Uh, Ward 8 is kind of like a river running down. I mean, I'd love to know how this ever happened, seriously. And hearing about the school board representation, that I never knew about or thought about, but thank you, Keith. So Jack and Zariah, you know, I'm not sure, I doubt you were even involved in creating Ward 8. Well, Jack might, I don't know. But anyway, how did it happen? Especially it seems like it wasn't legal. And I agree, we just need to, you know, Ward 8, what did it solve? Nothing. We are still underrepresented in Ward 1. So it didn't solve anything. So if we go back to a blocky system and we change the line so that we are more equitably represented, I love Jack's idea of 12 counselors, not this East District and all those different ones where they have to like double over. I can't imagine running in those wards. Like, it's just a ridiculous thing. So I really think that's great, and we just, they need to do the boundary lines. Linda Rizvi said that, like, legally, there's not supposed to be any appendages off. Well, Ward 8 was an appendage all on its own. So who did this? Like, I'd love to know. I don't know. Well, I, I have, I have some ideas. I have some ideas, but. So Karen, you're, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, I encourage you to run those surveys again, because, like, we saw them once on front No, 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 Farm. Karen, we are, there's going to be, there's supposed to be a universal survey being created for oh, okay. all the wards, and I don't know if Richard's planning to post it again, but I will post, um, I will post it on the, right. the downtown front porch forum and whatever front porch forums encompass Thank ward you. eight. And then, uh, like I said, I think on the city website, they're supposed to be posting it. So Karen, I just want to make sure that I tabulate your response. So your um, suggestion would be for changing the boundaries. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like they should be blocks, like you know, Colorado. And, you know I'm what sorry. Mean? Like not in the, any of these, like the river running down. All right, I can't put my elbows on the table. Okay. Other folks. That yes, have thank you. I just I want to echo just more, you know more thoroughly the, the point about and I tease your words and to have the, the words more reflective of, of neighborhoods, I think makes some sense, makes a lot of sense. And maybe maybe we can take some time apart from this meeting to think about what that might look like so we can give some more specific suggestions. Any more comments from folks online? You can raise your hand in person. Yep. I have, a, I have a comment. I'm, I, I have more of a question. Um, I, I, I suspect that Ward A was wrong the way it was to be inclusive of students on the campus. Is that correct? 
I mean, yeah, I, I think I think it was billed as the student ward yeah, when so, it was created. And so ever since living in Burlington, I've always wondered about the wisdom of having part-time students at the risk of offending students in the in the area here. And there's a lot of nice ones, but there's a lot of but they're here temporarily, and I don't understand how they represent the long-term interests of this community. And I just don't understand the wisdom of including them in the voting block. And you know, not to say they don't have a say about the community they live in, but they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand it. And we live right on College Street, and we see we see the mess that's created up and down the streets and the the adjacent blocks. And it's really discouraging. And and you know, to Keith's point, you know, maybe the, those folks are recruited the day of the election to swing an election or to convince or to get a, a vote going because they only register because they're told to register. But they're not participating in this community. And you know, we pay we all pay property taxes here, you know, those of us who own properties here. And I think that we're underrepresented because there's so many students who are trying to be inclusive of. And I just don't see the balance. And right. so redrawing the districts, especially Ward 8, um, might be more inclusive by eliminating that those, you know, like I said, at the, at the risk of offending, you know, larger groups of people, I just don't see them as part of this community. Well, they are legally allowed to vote. Um, I think there was actually a Supreme Court decision that determined that, but I understand your point. So I think your suggestion is about boundaries again, changing the boundaries. So it's more neighborhood, less Okay. Student ward, right? right? I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, I shouldn't think about the demographic. It should be about the geography. Right, right, geography. Right. Okay. Um, other comments? What? Yeah, you can oh, My reason for coming uh, as the interloper for Ward 3 was... We can't hear well, you. Good enough, <coughs> my reason for coming uh, as the interloper for Ward 3 was largely due to my prior service on the committee. Uh, prior to my departure, I was one of the individuals tasked with uh, developing the citywide survey, which I believe is still uh, under development. And George Love from Ward 2 and uh, Daniel Mutineau, who is the new uh, member uh, representing Ward 3, are kind of been taking the lead with that. Uh, what I can share with you tonight is some of the discussions that were had uh, with George prior to my departure from the committee uh, in terms of the process here. Um, one of the things that uh, has come out was, uh, you know, the boundaries and whatnot. Um, there was also some, you know, fundamental ideas on like what the council should look like. You know, again, the districts versus the wards. We're trying to get a handle on that. Um, one of the concerns was that having an online survey does preclude, you know, a certain uh, demographic from participating. So there was thought to really do like, you know, like a door-to-door -door effort or do some like door hangers to really get the word out. Um, having worked personally uh, for a company that specialized in doing surveys for the government, I know that you need to get a certain number of responses in order for the survey to be quote unquote statistically valid. Uh, I think, you know, from uh, that perspective, really it's incumbent upon the city uh, and, the com and the committee, but more so the city, to ensure that we get an adequate number of responses um, once the survey instrument has been uh, finalized and approved by the advisory committee. Uh, so I'm hopeful that um, you know there's a good get out the get out the uh, opinion effort to to get that kind of input there. Um, I'm just wondering how would the door to door, whatever it is you're handing out, generate survey um, by responses? By going door to door and having uh, one to one contact with uh, people who live in the ward, um, you could basically have a conversation with them. If they had questions, it'd be an opportunity to answer any questions. Also, you know, give them the importance of it, but also it would be something that's directly on their door. They could see and look, oh, hey, here's a URL. I can go to it. We would okay. have some information. Okay. So, they may not be subscribed to Front Porch Forum. Right. They may not be hearing other ways. So okay. really trying to, to get the word out, um, you know, a lot of uh, different ways uh, to do that. Um, my interest was, you know, I've always been a big fan of process. I've always felt that, you know, um, people can live with a decision that they may not personally agree with if they feel that they've had a, a seat at the table. Um, and looking at where we are today and what we have in place now, it, it does conjure up a number of questions for me um, as to how we got there. I have had some you know, informal conversations with folks that were involved uh, previously. And uh, to kind of make a long story short, I 
encapsulated in a nutshell. I think the answer is political compromise uh, is how we, we got there. Um, but I think one of the, the points that came up um, in addition to looking at boundaries that many of the folks in this room are advocating was um, actual representation. You know, the city council is supposed to be a representative body. And so um, I know when I served on, on the school board, Mr. Pillsbury here, we had seven wards with two representatives from each ward for the board and the, and the council, uh, a total of 14 individuals. And you know, the smaller we make this, the bigger the wards, so you more people. And there's been research done that demonstrates that when you have a smaller district, a, a smaller number of people, engagement goes up because your representative is, um, you know, it's, it's more accessible. So that was definitely one thing that was discussed in the de uh, development of the survey, and I suspect there's going to be a question of what is the ideal size of the council. I think the range that had been initially discussed was from 8 to 16, and corresponding with that will be a table that says, okay, if we have eight seats, this is how many people are in the ward, all the way up to is if we have 16 seats versus this is how many people we have in the wards. And to Councillor Hansen's point, um, you know, if we did a 14 wards or 16 wards or 15 wards, if we need to go to an odd number, whatever it is, the greater the number of wards, the smaller the population and the greater the likelihood of investment there. So that was something that really came out uh, on it. Um, I know that uh, there was also some feelings regarding equality of population, as many folks have emphasized, uh, you know, the statute is 10%. Um, I think there's some feeling from folks that, uh, you know, we can and should do better and, you know, maybe try to make it as equal as possible. Um, so those were some of the things that came up. Um, Georgia and Daniel are still working on that, uh, and I suspect they're going to have a draft at the next full committee meeting, uh, which I believe is next week. I'm, I'm not getting emails anymore, so I'm, I'm not sure. There's another committee meeting? I, I had heard that there was. Um, okay. I'm not really sure, about that? but mainly wanted to come because I had gotten an email from UN about what was going on. I said, you know, I'm two blocks away. I'll just swing by. Wondering about the survey. And it's, it's a topic of interest to me. And, you know, being that I'm, I'm on the other side of South Mesquite, I live on College Street above Patagonia, so not too far away, um, having also lived over on Buell Street for 13 years. Um, so I kind of see some kinship here. But um, what I had asked, uh, Kirsten, is it? Yeah, yes. Kirsten. Pull up. Um, there is a page that I wanted to pull up on the city. It's a history of redistricting, which I think has some great information. I just wanted to ask her to pull that up quickly so folks could kind of take a, a look at some things. Uh, and I would ask that you open the PDF version of the 1865 map, um, and then we'll go on to the 1950. It's at the very top. The 1865 uh, map? Yep, the okay. uh, PDF. PDF version. And um, I bring this up just based on what I've heard from a lot of folks here about where the boundaries should be, how we should, how ward, the districts and wards should be contiguous, how there should be preservation of communities of interest. Uh, so I thought maybe having a historical perspective might, uh, you know, inform the discussion a little bit. So I wanted to call out attention if you scroll down a little bit there, Kirsten, in Ward Four, which is kind of the center city. If you if you look at that. Um, and what I don't know how much resolution that? we can what have here. What color is that? That's the green, green. block. Green. Oh, green. It's worth work. In the center of the nice okay. clean mm -hmm. rectangle. Yeah. Um, that encapsulates the downtown core. Uh, the downtown core, as I understand, has traditionally been Pearl Street South to Maine and over to uh, South Union. Uh, looking at that, you have the downtown core and the residential neighborhoods here of the uh, Part portions of Ward 8 and I think some portions of Wards 5 and present day Wards 5 and 6. So I don't know if that is, you know, something that interests folks, but I wanted to point it out. There is this information out there. If you want to look at the historical uh, development and how things have evolved over the last 150 years, uh, I personally found it to be uh, informative and I just wanted to share that with everyone here. So uh, I'll get off my soapbox now. Thanks. So I want to be mindful of time because we do have to be out by 8:45. It's 8:30. So any, I Sandy's had their hand up for a while online. So I would vote to let her speak and then wrap up the other comments. Um, so Sandy, go. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Loud and clear. And thank, and thank you, first off, for um, taking the time to do what you guys are doing. My understanding of the last time that the uh, council got reorganized the way it currently is, nobody liked it. Nobody was happy, and this was a compromise of no one really liking what they were ending up with. 
Um, I don't think there was anyone that was particularly happy. Ward 8 was a political decision, the way the lines were drawn, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, there was a, at least one council person that wanted property in one ward and not in the other. Um, it was very politically chosen, and that's why that, that ward is so weird. Um, <laughs> there was not a lot of logic, but there was political rationale behind it, and I'll leave it at that. But thank you for all that you're doing. I do support your conclusion so far. Let's let's reorganize, re you know, draw new lines. It's crazy the way it is. It's so blatantly gerrymandered. Anyway, thank you guys. Thanks, Thank Sandy. You, Sandy. So, Ann and Richard, any final comments before we wrap up? No, I'll be glad to come to the next um, NPA meeting because that will now be within yeah. the... <laughs> That's all. I just want to say that Ward 8 also has three legislative districts which are so convolu convoluted. One side of the street is on one legislative district, the other side is the other side, yet we have the lofts that split in half, one's Ward 6, one's Ward 8. We have. Redstone Commons, because all Redstone's in Ward 8. Redstone Commons on Redstone is Ward 6. That is how crazy the whole thing is. And if I sound crazy, it's because trying to do this every election day and, and with volunteers who do not know our ward, it's very difficult to f help people to vote. And, that's, and as our city clerk says, Ward 8 doesn't get many votes, but we work the hardest for each vote, and that is true. Thank you. So as a um, steering committee person, can we put you guys on again for November? Does that make sense? I, can, I think I can do it. Okay. So that's the okay. 10th, is it? What, what date is it? I can, I'll look. Yeah, we can reach out and, and see if that works. I think so. I, I have to look at my calendar, yeah, but okay. I think so. And we will hope to be in a place where we really, really can hear each other. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. okay. We now, own a microphone. Oh, Remember? We're move on Jonathan? to uh, Darren with the net zero plan. Um, go thank to you bed. for being patient with us. Uh, feel free to go. Okay. Thanks. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Darren Springer, general manager with Burlington Electric, and I'm joined by a colleague, Emily Seven Willock, who's on as well. Um, I realize that uh, we have a little bit of a time constraint here. Um, so what I'm going to do is share my screen and uh, just run through some slides very quickly. And obviously glad to answer questions uh, if you have them. Um, and if we run out of time, I'm glad to follow up with folks um, offline as well. Uh, so let me just get this uh, presentation up and running. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so we're talking tonight about the net zero energy revenue bond uh, that is going to be on the ballot uh, December 7th. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead here and just highlight some items. Uh, the revenue bond is a uh, obligation if it's passed solely of Burlington Electric and payable through our revenues. This is not an obligation of the city general fund. It does not impact on property taxes or other taxes. Uh, requires a majority approval of Burlington voters and uh, does not affect the city's debt ratio or debt policy. Uh, and we've got a number of examples where we've used the revenue bond in the past uh, for some of our renewable energy plants like McNeil and Renewski One uh, and for energy efficiency and other infrastructure uh, projects. Um, we actually had an $11.3 million revenue bond for efficiency back in 1990. That really was the foundation of our energy efficiency investments in the city. Uh, we're using less electricity today than we were in 1989, in part because of energy efficiency. And now that we're moving towards the climate goal that we have as a city of 2030, trying to become net zero, uh, reducing and eliminating fossil fuel use for heating and for ground transportation, uh, we're looking at this revenue bond as a similar foundational support uh, for our efforts uh, in that regard, and also to invest in key infrastructure and reliability uh, for our system. 
So the $20 million revenue bond proposal, uh, about 12.3 million would go into the grid, uh, both to upgrade our systems, to accommodate uh, new uses like electric vehicles and electric bikes and heat pumps and other electric uh, clean energy technologies, as well as reliability upgrades. Uh, we would invest about 3.9 million in replacing our aging technology systems, about 2.2 million in our renewable energy plants, and about 1.5 million in infrastructure investments that support net zero, uh, new EV charging stations, for example, uh, new electric bucket truck uh, for our line crew, and other investments uh, along those lines. Uh, the other piece of this is by moving forward in this manner, we can utilize some of our annual bond funding uh, to double the rate that we're funding customer incentives. Uh, we've had about 1,400 uh, Burlington Electric customers take advantage of our incentives uh, for heat pumps and heat bikes and heat lawn mowers and uh, electric vehicles and cold climate heat pumps and all these different technologies. And uh, we're seeing even more demand, so we want to support our customers in moving in this direction. Uh, we can reduce emissions significantly uh, by, by doing this, and uh, uh, that's a key part of the strategy as well. Uh, this chart here just illustrates what I just mentioned, which is uh, compared to state requirements, we're actually seeing Burlington customers uh, going above and beyond uh, what's required in terms of adopting these new technologies. Uh, the green line, the, the lower green line, is the state obligation. Uh, and the blue line, the dark blue line, is where we actually are in Burlington. You can see we're going well above and beyond, and we want to fund that strategy to continue uh, to invest in those technologies. Uh, key question, what does this do relative to rates? Uh, we just had our first rate case in 12 years coming out of the pandemic. What we're seeing is that um, in order to uh, maintain some of the financial metrics that we had with Moody's, and we just had our A3 credit rate affirmed by Moody's in August, um, with the revenue bond, we can reduce upward rate pressure significantly. Uh, we would see about 4.9% of upward rate pressure projected next year. That's not a rate case, that's just the amount of pressure that we would see on our budget um, and could lead to a rate case, but doesn't necessarily reflect that. Without the revenue bond, as you can see, if we try to maintain all of our metrics and make all of these investments, uh, you have over 23% upward rate pressure, which is not something that we want to see and not something that we or our customers uh, would support, obviously. Um, and then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here because the point of these slides is how are we going to repay the revenue bond? Uh, there are two key pieces to that. One is uh, we have an existing revenue bond that's going to mature, uh, which creates about 684000 of capacity annually to support repayment on the new net zero bond. And we also are going to realize uh, some revenues as a result of more customers moving towards those electric technologies. And that can support uh, approximately 40% of the repayment on the annual bonds and the revenue bond. Uh, so all together, uh, we're projecting that in uh, you know five years from now, when we were repaying principal on this bond, uh, that this uh, investment will put approximately 1% of upward rate pressure on our budget with those uh, savings that I just mentioned realized. Um, so I've gone as quickly as I can, uh, respecting your time constraints, and I'm back here on the screen to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Um, I see Keith has there. One question I have, Darren, is just simple. When people plug into those those chargers on Main Street or wherever, who pays for that electricity? Is that come out of our? Is that the, so the general fund that we all pay into? No, so in terms of the public chargers uh, that we have, including the ones on Main Street, uh, customers who park at the charger and use it are paying per kilowatt hour uh, for the electricity that they're using at those chargers. Um, so those are investments that we make to support electric vehicle deployment, uh, but we charge per kilowatt hour uh, for any of the use of the energy, and that's how we recruit some revenues uh, from those drivers. Thank you. Do any other folks have questions? I'm not seeing any hands up. Uh, actually, I see Tom. Just, uh, just a quick question. We have a copy of this presentation? Yeah, yeah we, I'm sure we can get a copy of the presentation. Yeah, yeah. It's on um, the MPA website, and it's also right there in physical form. Amazing. Okay, thanks. Thank you.
Um, thank you so much for going quickly, and I'm sorry that it was so crunched for time. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Thank you sorry. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, and right on time, we're going to go into the raffle. So, Carol, Tom, if you want to explain that, maybe. Yeah, we're having a raffle. We're handing out some local VOR uh, memberships. And um, so we've made a, a list of people who qualify for we're this. We're here, yeah. And um, we just need a volunteer to pick the names out of the hat or out of the bowl. Maybe Charlie will do that for us. Charlie will just do making that. sure folks heard, we're raffling off local board subscriptions. It, we used Me part too. of our NPA funding to do it. And everyone that attended the meeting tonight that isn't a steering committee member got entered in to win. So that's kind of context. So, we, and yeah. So the two people, and we're also going to give one, I think, to Richard and Ann, right? After, after they get done. After they, after, after they get done? After they get done. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're pretty done. Um, Cheryl Green gets one of the coupon uh, packets, and Lisa Bridge, who was Ward 8, um, gets one of the packets. All right. Uh, Lisa and Cheryl won this one. We have more to raffle off in the next NPAs. So yes, please come. Please keep coming. All right. Uh, Thanks. Just, I think I got a, a couple, a minute. How do I get a hold of Cheryl Green and Lisa Bridge? Well, Cheryl's Cheryl. right there. Oh, right here. Sure. And Lisa, Sorry. I bet Keith will. Keith can get a hold um, of Lisa. Right? Thank you all so much so for Lisa coming. Lisa on the screen for bearing with us with the audio. Figure it out. Is she on the screen right now, uh, so she knows? No, she, no, was, she was back here. I thought you had to stay to the end to win. I'm familiar with this for because of Ward Two Three. I'm going to close out the meeting, so everyone Thank say you. bye to folks online. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.